Talk. Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your reader today. We're going to go on a great adventure today to a far off land in the sense of many, many, many miles away. We're going to South Africa today, and we're going to talk uh, from the book by Trevor Noah. Many of you know him, of course, uh, from the wonderful Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Uh, and today's book is called It's Trevor Noah, Born a Crime. And uh, let me read a couple of things to you for starters from the jacket cover, which I always enjoy doing. Uh, let me tell you here, Trevor Noah, the funny guy who hosts the Daily Show on Comedy Central, shares his remarkable story about growing up in South Africa with a black South African mother and a white European father at a time when it was against the law for a mixed race child to exist. But he did exist. And from the beginning, the often misbehaved Trevor used his keen smarts and humor to navigate a harsh life under a racist government. This fascinating memoir blends drama, comedy, and tragedy to depict the day-to-day -day trials that turned a boy into a young man. In a country where racism barred Blacks from social, educational, and economic opportunity, Trevor surmounted staggering obstacles and created a promising future for himself, thanks to his mom's unwavering love and indomitable will. It's Trevor Noah, Born a Crime, not only provides a fascinating and honest perspective on South Africa's racial history, but it also astounds and inspires young readers and readers everywhere looking to improve their own lives. The book is a great deal to do with his mother, actually. At one point, I thought he should perhaps even change the title. This is one thing that uh, he does say about his mother on the back of the, of the cover. If my mother had one goal, it was to free my mind. My mother spoke to me like an adult. She was always let, telling me stories, giving me lessons, Bible lessons especially. She was big into Psalms. I had to read Psalms every day. She would quiz me on it. What does the passage mean? What does it mean to you? How do you apply it to your life? That was every day of my life. My mom did what school didn't. She taught me how to think. And as the New York Times bestseller, here's what the New York Times said, through the foreign, the familiar, and the funny, Born a Crime is a piercing reminder that every mad life, even yours, could end up a masterpiece. <laughs> so Trevor Noah, the most successful comedian in Africa, is of course the host of the Emmy and Peabody Award winning The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Trevor received the 2020 Grammy nomination for Best Comedy Album for Trevor Noah son of Patricia, <laughs> and the 2020 NAACP Image Award nominations for Outstanding Writing in a Comedy Series and Outstanding Host in a Talk or News Information Series or Special. Trevor recently received a 2020 Webby Award for Best in Comedy for The Daily Show as well as an NAACP Image Award nomination for Outstanding Talk Series. Trevor originally joined The Daily Show with Jon Stewart in 2014 as a contributor. In 2019, The Daily Show received two primetime Emmy nominations, including Outstanding Variety Talk Series and Outstanding Interactive Program. Additionally, Trevor received the 2019 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Writing. Trevor Noah, an incredible life and an incredible sex story. Success story for him on The Daily Show, uh, which has continued now in its 26th season. 
So let's read from uh, Trevor's wonderful book, Born a Crime. He begins with a preface, which I've chosen to uh, read today because it, it puts us back in perspective. All of us, of course, in one way or another, we're familiar with the many, many years of apartheid. And uh, we were, of course, familiar with Nelson Mandela. But being on the other side of the planet from South Africa, uh, we, some of us anyway, uh, we're not totally aware of all the ramifications and all the specifications and all the rules, et cetera, that existed during apartheid. So he starts with a fairly serious preface, and then we'll get into a bit more humorous story of his life. Let me start this way. Apartheid, the South African government policy of racial segregation was genius at convincing people who were the overwhelming majority to turn on each other. Apart hate is what it was. You separate people into groups and make them hate one another so you can control them. During the years of apartheid, black South Africans outnumbered white South Africans nearly five to one, yet we were divided into different tribes with different languages. Zulu, Kosa, Swana, Sotho, Venda, Debele, Tsonga, Pedi, and more. Long before apartheid existed, these tribal factions clashed and warred with one another. Then white rule used that animosity to devour, to divide and conquer. All non-whites were systematically classified into various groups and subgroups. Then these groups were given differing levels of rights and privileges to keep them at odds. Perhaps the starkest of these divisions was between South Africa's two dominant groups, the Zulu and the Kosa. The Zulu man is known as the warrior. He is proud. He puts his head down and fights. When the colonial armies, armies invaded, the Zulu charged into battle with nothing but spears and shields against men with guns. The Zulu were slaughtered by the thousands, but they never stopped fighting. The Kosa, on the other hand, pride themselves on being the thinkers. My mother is Kosa. Nelson Mandela, the anti-apartheid revolutionary who was imprisoned for 27 years and who eventually became South Africa's first black president was Kosa. The Kosa waged a long war against the white man as well, but after experiencing the futility of battle against a better armed foe, many Kosa chiefs took a more nimble approach. These white people are here, whether we like it or not, they said. Let's see what tools they possess that can be useful to us. Instead of being resistant to English, Let's learn English. We'll understand what the white man is saying and we can force him to renegotiate with us. The Zulu went to war with the white man. The Kosa played chess with the white man. For a long time, neither was particularly successful and each blamed the other for a problem neither had created. Bitterness festered, for decades, those feelings were held in check by a common enemy. Then apartheid fell. Mandela walked free and black South Africa went to war with itself. Chapter one, run. I was nine years old when my mother threw me out of a moving car. It happened on a Sunday. I knew it was on a Sunday because we were coming home from church and every Sunday in my childhood meant church. We never missed church. My mother was and still is a deeply religious woman, very Christian, 
Like indigenous peoples around the world, black South Africans adopted the religion of our colonizers. By adopt, I mean, it was forced on us. My childhood involved church or some form of church, at least four nights a week. Tuesday night was the prayer meeting. Wednesday night was Bible study. Thursday night was youth church. Friday and Saturday, we had off. Then on Sunday, we went to church. Three churches, to be precise. The reason we went to three churches was because my mom said each church gave us something different. The first church offered jubilant praise of the Lord. The second church offered deep analysis of the scripture, which my mom loved. The third church offered passion and catharsis. It was a place where you truly felt the presence of the Holy Spirit inside you. Completely by coincidence, as we moved back and forth between these churches, I noticed that each one had its own distinct racial makeup. Jubilant church was mixed church. Analytical church was white church. And passionate cathartic church, that was black church. Mixed church was Rhema Bible church. Rhema is one of those huge super modern suburban mega churches. The pastor, Ray McCauley, was an ex bodybuilder with a big smile and the personality of a cheerleader. Pastor Ray had competed in the 1974 Mr. Universe competition. He placed third. The winner that year was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Every week, Ray would be up on stage working really hard to make Jesus cool. There was arena style seating and a rock band jamming with the latest Christian contemporary pop. Everyone sang along and if you didn't know the words, that was okay because they were all right up there on the jumbotron for you. It was Christian karaoke, basically. I always had a blast at mixed church. White church was Rosebank Union in Santon a very white and wealthy part of Johannesburg. I love white church because I didn't actually have to go to the main service. My mom would go to that and I would go to the youth side to Sunday school. In Sunday school, we got to read cool stories. Noah and the flood was obviously a favorite. I had a personal stake there, but I also loved the stories about Moses parting the Red Sea. David slaying Goliath, Jesus whipping the money changes in the temple. I grew up in a home with very little exposure to popular culture. My mom didn't want my mind polluted by sex and violence. The only music I really knew was church, soaring, uplifting songs, praising Jesus. It was the same with movies. The Bible was my action movie. Samson was my superhero. He was my he-man. A guy beating a thousand people to death with the jawbone of a donkey? <laughs> That's pretty fierce. Eventually, you get to Paul writing letters to the Ephesians, and it loses the plot. But the Old Testament and the Gospels, I could quote you anything from those pages, chapter and verse. There were Bible games and quizzes every week at White Church, and I always trounced everyone. Then there was black church. There were always some kind of black church service going on somewhere, and we tried them all. In the township, that typically meant an outdoor tent revival style church. We usually went to my grandmother's church, an old school Methodist congregation, 500 African grannies in blue and white blouses clutching their Bibles and patiently burning in the hot African sun. Black church was rough, no air conditioning, no lyrics up on the jumbotrons, and it lasted forever, three or four hours at least, which confused me because white church was only like an hour, in and out, thanks for coming. But as black church, I would sit there for what felt like an eternity, trying to figure out why time moved so slowly. 
I eventually decided black people needed more time with Jesus because we suffered more. Black church had one saving grace. If I could make it to the third or fourth hour, I'd get to watch the pastor cast demons out of people. People possessed by demons would start running up and down the aisles like madmen screaming in tongues. The ushers would tackle them like bouncers at a club and hold them down. The pastor would grab their heads and violently shake them back and forth, shouting, I cast out this spirit in the name of Jesus. Some pastors were more violent than others, but what they all had in common was that they wouldn't stop until the demon was gone and the congregation had gone limp and collapsed on stage. The person had to fall because if he didn't fall, that meant the demon was powerful and the pastor needed to come to him even harder. You could be a linebacker in the NFL, didn't matter. That pastor was taking you down. Good Lord, that was fun. Christian karaoke, fierce action stories and violent faith healers. Man, I love church. The thing I didn't love was the lengths we had to go to in order to get to church. It was an epic slog. We lived in Eden Park, a tiny suburb way outside Johannesburg. It took us an hour to get to White Church, another 45 minutes to get to Mixed Church, and another 45 minutes to drive to Soweto for Black Church. Then, if that wasn't bad enough, some Sundays we'd drive back to White Church for a special evening service. By the time we got home at night, I'd collapse into bed. This particular Sunday, the Sunday I was hurled from a moving car, started unlike any other Sunday. My mother woke me up, made me porridge for breakfast. I took my bath while she dressed my baby brother, Andrew, who was nine months old. Then we went out to the driveway. But once we were all strapped in and ready to go, the car would not start. My mom had the ancient, broken down, bright tangerine Volkswagen Beetle that she picked up for next to nothing. And it was always breaking down. To this day, I hate secondhand cars. I'll take a new car with a warranty every time. As much as I love church, taking public transport meant the slog would be twice as long and twice as hard. When the Volkswagen refused to start, I was praying, please say we'll stay home. Please say we'll just stay home. Then I glanced over to see a determined look on my mother's face, her jaw set, and I knew I had a long day ahead of me. Come, she said, we're going to catch minibuses. My mother is as stubborn as she is religious. Over her mind, once her mind's made up, that's it. It's the devil, she said about the stalled car. The devil doesn't want us to go to church. That's why we've got to catch minibuses. Whenever I found myself up against my mother's faith-based obstinacy, I would try, as respectively as possible, to counter with an opposing point of view. Or, I said, the Lord knows that today we shouldn't go to church, which is why he made sure the car wouldn't start, so that we stay at home as a family and take a day of rest because... Even the Lord rested. Ah, uh, that's the devil talking, Trevor. No, because Jesus is in command. And if Jesus is in control and we pray to Jesus, he would let the car start. But he hasn't. Therefore, no, Trevor. Sometimes Jesus puts obstacles in your way to see if you overcome them. Like Job, this could be a test. Ah, yes, mom, but the test could be to see if we're willing to accept what has happened and stay at home and praise Jesus for his wisdom. No, that's the devil talking. But mom, Trevor, <laughs> Sankela is a phrase she used frequently, and it has many shades of meaning. It says, don't undermine me. Don't underestimate me and 
just try me. It's a command and a threat all at once. It's a com common thing for Shosuk parents to say to their kids, any time I heard it, I knew it meant the conversation was over. And if I uttered another word, I was in for a hiding. At the time, I attended a private Catholic school called Maryville College. I was the champion of the Maryville Sports Day every single year. And my mother won the mom's trophy every single year. Why? Because she was always chasing me to give me a hiding. And I was always running not to get the hiding. Nobody ran like me and my mom. We had a very Tom and Jerry relationship. She was the strict disciplinarian. I was incorrigibly naughty. She would send me out to buy groceries and I would come right home because I'd be using the change from the milk and bread to play arcade games at the supermarket. I loved video games. I was a master at Street Fighter. I could go forever on a single play. I'd drop a coin in, time would fly, and the next thing I knew, there'd be a woman behind me with a belt. It was a race. I'd take off out the door and through the dusty streets of Eden Park, clamoring over walls, ducking through backyards. It was a normal thing in our neighborhood. Everybody knew that Trevor child would come charging through and his mom would be right there behind him. She could go at a full sprint in high heels, but if she really wanted to come after me, she'd do this weird move with her ankles and the heels would go flying and she wouldn't even miss a step. That's when I knew, okay, she's in turbo mode now. When I was little, she always caught me, but as I got older, I got faster. And when speed failed her, she used her wits. If I was about to get away, she'd yell, stop, thief, knowing it would bring the whole neighborhood out against me. Then I'd have strangers trying to grab and tackle me, and I'd have to duck and dive and dodge them as well, all the while screaming, I'm not a thief, I'm her son. The last thing I wanted to do that Sunday morning was climb into some crowded minibus, but the second I heard my mom say, son Kayla, I knew my fate was sealed. She gathered up Andrew and we climbed out of the Volkswagen and went out to try to catch a ride. I was five years old or nearly six when Nelson Mandela was released from prison. I remember seeing it on TV and everyone being happy. I didn't know why they were happy, just that they were. I was aware of the fact that there was a thing called apartheid and it was ending and that was a big deal but I didn't understand the intricacies of it. What I do remember, what I will never forget, is the violence that followed. The triumph of democracy over apartheid is something sometimes called the bloodless revolution. It is called that because very little white blood was spilled. Black blood ran in the streets. As the apartheid regime fell, we knew that the black man was now going to rule. The question was, which black man? Spates of violence broke out between the Inkatha Freedom Party and the ANC, the African National Congress, as they jockeyed for power. The political dynamic between these two groups was very complicated, but the simplest way to understand it as a proxy war between Zulu and Kosa. The Inkatha was predominantly Zulu, very militant and very nationalistic. The ANC encompassed many different tribes, but its leaders at the time were primarily Kosa. Instead of uniting for peace, they turned on one another committing acts of unbelievable savagery. Massive riots broke out. In the evenings, my mom and I would turn on our little black and white TV and watch the news. A dozen people killed, 50 people killed, 100 people killed. Ultimately, thousands of people died. Eden Park sat not far from the sprawling townships in the East Rand. Thokasa, 
and Katlahong, which were the sites of some of the most horrific in Katha ANC clashes. Once a month, at least, we'd drive home and the neighborhood would be on fire. Hundreds of rioters in the street. My mom would edge the car slowly through the crowd, crowds and around blockades made of flaming tires. Nothing burns like a tire. It rages with a fury you can't imagine. Whenever the riots broke out, all our neighbors would wisely hole up behind closed doors. <laughs> Not my mom. She'd head straight out, and as we'd inch our way past the blockade, she'd give the rioters this look. Let me pass. I'm not involved in this chaos. She was unwavering in the face of danger. That always amazed me. It didn't matter that there was a war on our doorstep. She had things to do, places to be. It was the same stubbornness that kept her going to church despite a broken down car. That careless Sunday, we made our circuit of churches, ending up at White Church. When we walked out of Rosebank Union, it was dark and we were alone. It had been an endless day of minibuses and I was exhausted. It was nine o'clock at least. In those days, with all the violence and riots going on, you did not want to be out that late at night. We were standing at the corner of Jellicoe Avenue and Oxford Road, right in the heart of Johannesburg's wealthy white suburbia, and there were no minibuses. The streets were empty. I so badly wanted to turn to my mom and say, you see, this is why God wanted us to stay home. But one look at the expression on her face, and I do better than to speak. We waited and waited for a minibus to come by. Under apartheid, the government provided no public transportation for blacks, but white people still needed us to show up to mop their floors and clean their bathrooms. Necessity being the mother of invention, black people created their own transit system, an informal network of bus routes controlled by private associations operating entirely outside the law. Different groups ran different routes and they would fight over who controlled what. There was bribery and general shadiness that went on a great deal of violence and a lot of protection money paid to avoid violence. The one thing you didn't do was steal a route from a rival group. Drivers who stole routes would get killed. Being unregulated, minibuses were also very unreliable. When they came, they came. When they didn't, they didn't. Standing outside Rosebank Union, I was literally falling asleep on my feet and on a minibus in sight. Eventually my mother said, let's hitchhike. We walked and walked. And after what felt like an eternity, a car drove up and stopped. The driver offered us a ride and we climbed in. We hadn't gone two feet when suddenly a minibus swerved right in front of the car and cut us off. A Zulu driver got out with an Iwisa, a large traditional Zulu weapon, a war club basically, it's used to smash people's skulls in. Another dark guy, his crony, got out of the passenger seat. They walked up to the driver's side of the car we were in, grabbed the man who had offered us a ride, pulled him out and started shoving their clubs in his face. Why are you stealing our customers? Why are you picking people up? It looked like they were going to kill this guy. I knew that happened sometime. My mom spoke up. Hey, listen, he was just helping us. Leave him. We'll ride with you. That's what we wanted in the first place. So we got out of the first car and climbed into the minibus. We were the only passengers in the minibus. In addition to being violent gangsters, South African minibus drivers are notorious for complaining 
and haranguing mass passengers as they drive. This driver was a particularly angry one. As we rode along, he started lecturing my mother about being in a car with a man who was not her husband. My mother didn't suffer lectures from strange men. She told him to mind his own business. And when he heard her speaking in Cosa, that really set him off. The stereotypes of Zulu and Koza women were as ingrained as those of the men. Zulu women were well-behaved and dutiful. Koza women were immoral and unfaithful. And here was my mother, his tribal enemy, a Koza woman alone with two small children, one of them a mixed child, no less. Oh, oh you're a Koza, he said. That explains it, disgusting women. Tonight, you're going to learn your lesson. He sped off. He was driving fast and he wasn't stopping, only slowing down to check for traffic at the intersections before speeding through. Death was never far away from anybody back then. My mother could be harmed. We could be killed. There were all variable outcomes, but I didn't fully comprehend the danger we were in. I was so tired that I just wanted to sleep. But my mom stayed very calm. She didn't panic, so I didn't know to panic. She just kept trying to reason with him. I'm sorry if we've upset you, Booty. You can just let us out here. No. Really, it's fine. We can just walk. No. He raced along Oxford Road, the lanes empty, no other cars out. I was sitting closest to the minibus's sliding door. My mother sat next to me holding baby Andrew. She looked out the window at the passing road and then leaned over to me and whispered, Trevor, when he slows down at the next intersection, I'm going to open the door and we're going to jump. I didn't hear a word of what she was saying because by the that point I'd completely nodded off. When we came to the next traffic light, the driver eased off the gas to look around and check the road. My mother reached over, pulled the sliding door open, grabbed me and threw me out as far as she could. Then she took Andrew and leaped out behind me. It felt like a dream until the pain hit. Bam, I smacked hard on the pavement. My mother landed right beside me and we tumbled and tumbled and rolled and rolled. It was wide awake time now. Eventually I came to a stop and pulled my, myself up completely disoriented. I looked around and saw my mother already on her feet. She turned and looked at me and screamed, run. So I ran and she ran and nobody ran like me and my mom. It's weird to explain, but I just knew what to do. It was an animal instinct, learned in a world where violence was always lurking and waiting to erupt. In the townships where the people came swooping in with their riot gear and armored cars and helicopters, I knew run for cover, run and hide. I knew that as a five-year-old. So like the gazelle runs from the lion, I ran. The men stopped the minibus and got out and tried to chase us, but they didn't stand a chance. We smoked them, I think they were in shock. I still remember glancing back and seeing them give up with a look of utter bewilderment on their faces. They didn't know they were dealing with the reigning champs of the Maryville College Sports Day. We kept going until we made it to a 24 hour petrol station and called the police. My then the men were long gone. I still didn't know why any of this had happened. I'd been running on pure adrenaline. Once we stopped, I realized how much pain I was in. I looked down and the skin on my arms was scraped and torn. I was cut up and bleeding all over. Mom was too. My baby brother was fine though, incredibly. My mom had wrapped herself around him and he'd come through without a scratch. I turned to her in shock. What was that? Why are we running? What do you mean, why are we running? Those men were going to kill us. 
You never told me that. You just threw me out of the car. I did tell you. Why didn't you jump? Jump? I was asleep. So I should have left you there for them to kill you. At least they would have mowed me up before they killed me. Back and forth we went. I was too confused and too angry about getting thrown out of the car to realize what had happened. My mother had saved my life. As we caught our breath and waited for the police to come and drive us home, she said, well, at least we're safe, thank God. I wasn't going to keep quiet this time. Look, mom, I said, I know you love Jesus, but maybe next week you could ask him to meet us at our house because this really was not a fun night. She broke out in a huge smile and started laughing. I started laughing too, and we stood there, this little boy and his mom, our arms and legs covered in blood and dirt, laughing together in the light of a petrol station on the side of the road in the middle of the night. Apartheid was perfect racism. It took centuries to develop, starting all the way back in 1652, when the Dutch East India Company landed at the Cape of Good Hope and established a trading colony. Kapstad, later known as Cape Town, a rest stop for ships traveling between Europe and India. To impose white rule, the Dutch colonists went to war with the natives, ultimately developing a set of laws to subjugate and enslave them. When the British took over Cape Colony, the descendants of the original Dutch settlers trekked inland and developed their own language, culture, and customs, eventually becoming their own people the Afrikaners, the white tribe of Africa. The British abolished slavery in name, but kept it in practice. They did so because in the 1800s, in what had been written off as a near worthless way station on the route to the Far East, a few endless supply expendable bodies was needed to go to the ground and get it all out. And the British Empire fell, the Africana rose up to claim South Africa as its rightful inheritance. To maintain power in the face of the country's rising and restless black majority, the government realized they needed a newer and more robust set of tools. They set up a formal commission to go out and study institutionalized racism all over the world. They went to Australia. They went to the Netherlands. They went to America. They saw what worked and what didn't. Then they came back. Sorry, turn two pages instead of one published a report and the government used that knowledge to build the most advanced system of racial oppression known to man. Apartheid was a police state, a system of surveillance and laws designed to keep black people under total control. A full compendium of those laws would run more than 3000 pages and weigh approximately 10 pounds. But the general trust thrust of it should be easy enough for any American to understand. In America, you had the forced removal of the native peoples onto reservations, coupled with slavery, followed by segregation. Imagine all three of those things happening to the same group of people at the same time. That was apartheid. Chapter two, born a crime. I grew up in South Africa during apartheid, which was awkward because I was raised in a mixed family with me being the mixed one in the family. My mother, Patricia Nornby Iselo Noah is black. My father, Robert is white, Swiss German to be precise. During apartheid, one of the worst crimes you could commit was having sexual relations with a person of another race. Needless to say, my parents committed that crime. 
In any society built on institutional racism, race mixing doesn't merely challenge the system as unjust, it reveals the system as unsustainable and incoherent. Race mixing proves that races can mix, and in a lot of cases, want to mix. Because a mixed person embodies that rebuke to the logic of the system. Race mixing becomes a crime worse than treason. There were mixed kids in South Africa nine months after the first Dutch boats hit the beach in Table Bay. Just like America, the colonists have had their way with the native women as colonists so often do. Unlike in America, where anyone with one drop of black blood automatically became black, in South Africa, mixed people came to be classified as their own separate group, neither black nor white, but what we call colored. Colored people, black people, white people, and Indian people were forced to register their race with the government. Based on these clarifications, millions of people were uprooted and relocated. Indian areas were segregated from colored areas, which were segregated from black areas, all of them se segregated from white areas and separated from one another by buffer zones of empty land. Laws were passed prohibiting sex between Europeans and natives laws that were later amended to prohibit sex between whites and all non-whites. The government went to insane lengths to try to enforce these new laws. The penalty for breaking them was five years in prison. If an interracial couple got caught, God help them, the police would kick down the door, drag the couple out, beat them and arrest them. At least that's what they did to the black person. If you ask my mother whether she ever considered the ramifications of having a mixed child under apartheid, she will say no. She had a level of fearlessness that you have to possess to take on something like she did. If you stop to consider the ramifications, you'll never do anything. Still, it was a crazy, reckless thing to do. A million things had to go right for us to slip through the cracks the way we did for as long as we did. Under apartheid, if you were a black man, you worked on a farm or in a factory or in a mine. If you were a black woman, you worked in a factory or as a maid. Those were pretty much your only options. My mother didn't want to work in a factory. She was a horrible cook and never would have stood for some white lady telling her what to do all day. So, true to her nature, she found an option that was not among the ones presented to her. She took a secretarial course, a typing class. At the same time, a black woman learning how to type was like a blind person learning how to drive. It's an admirable effort, but you're unlikely to ever be called upon to execute the task. By law, white collar jobs and skilled labor jobs were reserved for whites. Black people didn't work in offices. My mom, however, was a rebel. And fortunately for her, her rebellion came along at the right moment. In the early 1980s, the South African government began making minor reforms in an attempt to quell international protest over the atrocities and human rights abuses of apartheid. Among those reforms was the token hiring of black workers in low level white collar jobs, like typists. Through an employment agency, my mom got a job as a secretary at ICI a multinational pharmaceutical company in Bramfontein, a suburb of Johannesburg. When my mom started working, she still lived with my grandfather in Soweto, the township where the government had relocated my family decades before. But my mother was unhappy at home 
And when she was 22, she ran away to live in downtown Johannesburg. There was only one problem. It was illegal for black people to live there. The ultimate goal of apartheid was to make South Africa a white country with every black person stripped of his or her citizenship and relocated to live in the homelands, the Bantustans, semi-sovereign black territories that were in reality puppet states of the government at Pretoria. But this so-called white country could not function without black labor to produce its wealth, which meant black people had to be allowed to live near white areas and townships, government planned ghettos built to house black workers like Soweto. The township was where you lived, but your status as a laborer was the only thing that permitted you to stay there. If your papers were revoked for any reason, you could be deported back to the homelands. To leave the township for work in the city or for any other reason, you had to carry a pass with your ID number. Otherwise, you could be arrested. There was also a curfew. <clears throat> Excuse me. After a certain hour, blacks had to be back home in the township or risk arrest. My mother didn't care. She was determined to never go home again. So she stayed in town, hiding and sleeping in public restrooms until she learned the rules of navigating the city from the other black woman who had contrived to live there. Many of these women were Kosa. They spoke my mother's language and showed her how to survive. They ta taught her how to dress up in a pair of maids overhauls to move around the city without being questioned. They also introduced her to white men who were willing to rent out flats in town. A lot of these men were foreigners, Germans and Portuguese who didn't care about the law. Thanks to her job, my mom had many money to pay rent. She met a German fellow through one of her friends and he agreed to let her a flat in his name. She moved in and bought a bunch of maids overalls to wear. She was caught and arrested several times for not having her ID on the way home from work, for being in a white area after hours. The penalty for violating the pass laws was 30 days in jail or a fine of 50 rand, nearly half her monthly salary. She would scrape together the money, pay the fine and go right back about her business. My mom's secret flat was in a neighborhood called Hillbrow. She lived in number 203. Down the corridor was a tall, brown-haired, brown-eyed Swiss German expat named Robert. He lived in 206. As a former trading colony, South Africa had always had a large expatriate community. People find their way here. Tons of Germans, lots of Dutch, Hillbrow at the time was the Greenwich Village of South Africa. It was a thriving scene, cosmopolitan and liberal. There were galleries and underground theaters where artists and performers dared to speak up and criticize the government in front of integrated crowds. There were restaurants and nightclubs, a lot of them foreign owned, that served a mixed clientele black people who hate the status quo and white people who simply thought it ridiculous. These people would have secret get togethers too, usually in someone's flat or in empty house basements that had been converted into clubs. Integration by its nature was a political act, but the get togethers themselves weren't political at all. People would meet up and hang out, have parties. My mom threw herself into that scene. She was all at, always at some club, some party, dancing, meeting people. She was a regular at the Hillbrow Tower, one of the tallest buildings in Africa at the time. It had a nightclub with a rotating dance floor on the top floor. It was an exhilarating time, but still dangerous. Sometimes the restaurants and clubs would get shut down, sometimes not. Sometimes the performers and patrons would get arrested. Sometimes not. It was a roll of the dice. 
My mother never knew whom to trust, who might turn on her or turn her into the police. Neighbors would report on one another. Living alone in the city, not being trusted and not being able to trust, my mother started spending more and more time in the company of someone with whom she felt safe, the tall Swiss man down the corridor in 206. He was 46, she was 24. He was quiet and reserved. She was wild and free. She would stop by his flat to chat. They'd go to underground get-togethers, go dancing at the nightclub with the rotating dance floor. Something clicked. The fact that this man was prevented by law from having a family with my mother was part of the attraction. She wanted a child, not a man stepping in to run her life. For my father's part, I know that for a long time he kept saying no to fathering a child. Eventually he said yes. Nine months after that yes, on February 20, 1984, my mother checked into Hillbrow Hospital for a scheduled C-section delivery. Estranged from her family, pregnant by a man she could not be seen with in public, she was alone. The doctors took her to the delivery room, cut open her belly and reached in and pull out, pulled out a half white, half black child who violated any number of laws, statutes, and regulations. I was born a crime. When the doctors pulled me out, there was an awkward moment when they said, huh, that's a very light-skinned baby. A quick scan of the delivery room revealed no man standing around to take credit. Who is the father, they asked. His father is from Swaziland, my mother said, referring to the tiny landlocked kingdom in the west of South Africa. They probably knew she was lying, but they accepted it because they needed an explanation. Under apartheid, the government labeled everything on your birth certificate, race, tribe, nationality. Everything had to be categorized. My mother lied and said I was born in Kakwane, the semi-sovereign homeland for Swazi people living in South Africa. So my birth certificate doesn't say that I'm Kosa, which technically I am, and it doesn't say that I'm Swiss, which the government wouldn't allow. It just says that I'm from another country. My father isn't on my birth certificate officially. He's never been my father. And my mother was prepared for him not to get involved. She rented a new flat for herself in Jobert Park, the neighborhood adjacent to Hillbrow, and that's where she took me when we left the hospital. But once I existed, my father realized he couldn't have a son living around the corner and not be a part of my life. So the three of us formed a kind of family as much as our peculiar situation would allow. I lived with my mom, We'd sneak around and visit my father when we could. Where most children are proof of their parents' love, I was the proof of their criminality. The only time I could be with my father was indoors. If we left the house, he'd have to walk across the street from us. My mom and I used to go to Jobert Park all the time. It's the central park for Johannesburg. Beautiful gardens, a zoo, a giant chessboard with human-sized pieces that people would play with. My mother tells me that once, when I was a toddler, my dad tried to go with us. We were in the park. He was walking a good bit away from us, and I ran after him, screaming, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. People started looking. He panicked and ran away. I thought it was a game and kept chasing him. I couldn't walk with my mother either. A light-skinned child with a black woman would raise too many questions. When I was a newborn, she could wrap me up and take me anywhere, but very quickly that was no longer an option. I was a giant baby, an enormous child. When I was one, you'd have thought I was two. When I was two, you'd have thought I was four. There was no way to hide me. My mom, same as she'd done with her flat and with her maid's uniforms, found the cracks in the system. It was illegal to be mixed, 
to have a black parent and a white parent, but it was not illegal to be colored, to have two parents who were both colored. So my mom moved me around the world as a colored child. She found a crash in a colored area where she could leave me while she was at work. There was a colored woman named Queen who lived in our block of flats. When we wanted to go out to the park, my mom would invite her to go with us. Queen would walk next to me and act like she was my mother. And my mother would walk a few steps behind, like she was the maid working for the colored woman. I've got dozens of pictures of me walking with this woman who looks like me, but who isn't my mother. And the black woman standing behind us who looks like she's photobombing the picture. That's my mom. When we didn't have a colored woman to walk with us, my mom would risk walking me on her own. She would hold my hand or carry me, but if a police showed up, she would have to drop me and pretend I wasn't hers. When I was born, my mother hadn't seen her family in three years, but she wanted me to know them and wanted them to know me. So the prodigal daughter returned. We lived in town, but I would spend weeks at a time with my grandmother in Soweto, often during the holidays. I have so many memories from the place that in my mind, it's like we lived there too. Soweto Township was a city unto itself with a population of nearly one million. There were only two roads in and out. That was so the military could lock us in, quell any rebellion. And if the monkeys ever went crazy and tried to break out of their cage, the Air Force would fly over and bomb everyone to oblivion. Growing up, I never knew that my grandmother lived in the center of a bullseye. In the city, as difficult as it was to get around, we managed. Enough people were out and about, black, white, and colored, going to and from work, that we would get lost in the crowd. But only black people were permitted in Soweto. It was much harder to hide someone who looked like me, and the government was watching much more closely. In the white areas, you rarely saw the police. And you did if it was officer friendly in his collateral collared shirt and pressed pants. In Soweto, the police were an, an occupying army. They didn't wear collared shirts. They wore riot gear. They were militarized. They operated in teams known as flying squads because they would swoop in out of nowhere, riding in armored personnel carriers, hippos, we called them, tanks with enormous tires and slotted holes in the side of the vehicle to fire their guns out of. He didn't mess, you didn't mess with a hippo. You saw one, you ran. That was a fact of life. Playing in my grandmother's house, I'd hear gunshots, screams, tear gas being fired into crowds. My memories of the hippos and the flying squads come from when I was five or six when apartheid was finally coming apart. I never saw the police before that because we could never risk the police seeing me. Whenever we went to Soweto, my grandmother refused to let me outside. If she was watching me, it was, no, 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 he doesn't leave the house. Behind the wall in the yard, I could play, but not in the street. And that's where the rest of the boys and girls were playing in the street. My cousins, the neighborhood kids, They'd open the gate and head out and roam free and come back at dusk. I beg my grandmother to go outside. Please, please, can I go play with my cousins? No, you're going to take where they're going not to take you. For the longest time, I thought she meant that the other kids were going to steal me, but she was talking about the police. Children could be taken. Children were taken. The wrong color kid in the wrong color area and the government would come in, strip your parents of custody and haul you off to an orphanage. To police, the townships, the government relied on its networks of impimpies, the anonymous snitches who'd inform on suspicious activity. There were also the blackjacks, black people who worked for the police. My grandmother's neighbor was a blackjack. 
She had to make sure he wasn't watching when she smuggled me in and out of the house. My grand still tells the story of when I was three years old and fed up with being a prisoner. I dug a hole under the gate in the driveway, wriggled through and ran off. Everyone panicked. A search party went out and tracked me down. I had no idea how much danger I was putting everyone in. The family could have been deported. My grand could have been arrested. My mom might have gone to prison and I probably would have been packed off to a home for colored kids. So I was kept inside. Other than those few instances of walking in the park, the flashes of memory I have from when I was young are almost all indoors. Me with my mom in her tiny flat, be my myself at my grand's. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know any kids besides my cousin. I wasn't a lonely kid. I was good at being alone. I read books, play with the toy that I had, make my imaginary worlds. I lived inside my head. I still live inside my head. To this day, you can leave me alone for hours and I'm perfectly happy entertaining myself. I have to remember to be with people. Obviously, I was not the only child born to black and white parents during apartheid. Traveling around the world today, I meet other mixed South Africans all the time. Our stories start off identically. We're around the same age. Their parents met at some underground party in Hillbro or Cape Town. They lived in an illegal flat. The difference is that in virtually every other case, they left. The white parents smuggled them out through Lesotho or Botswana, and they grew up in exile in England or Germany or Switzerland because being a mixed family under apartheid was just that unbearable. Once Mandela was elected, we could finally live free. Exiles started to return. I met my first one when I was around 17. He told me his story and I was like, wait, what? You mean we could have left? That was an option? Imagine being thrown out of an airplane. <laughs> you hit the ground and break all your bones. You go to the hospital and you heal and you move on and finally put the whole thing behind you. And then one day somebody tells you about parachutes. That's how I felt. I couldn't understand why we'd stayed. I went straight home and asked my mom, why? Why didn't we just leave? Why didn't we go to Switzerland? because I am not Swiss, she said, as stubborn as ever. This is my country. Why should I leave? Well, despite his amazing sense of humor on television, uh, he has obviously a very challenging beginning to his life. Uh, the book goes on and the word crime becomes the operative word actually because of the environment, uh, as one can expect and one can even anticipate. Um, so from uh, illegally copying CDs and opening his own DJ company uh, on the back streets of Soweto um, to a great variety of things simply to get ahead. Uh, and from his DJ days, he moved on into the television world. That obviously is a way too quick capsulization of his career. But from there, he became uh, Africa's most famous comedian. And then finally to here in America. So it's very difficult, but a very interesting and challenging book to read. And it is going back to something I read earlier in the New York Times, through the foreign, the familiar and the funny, born a crime is a piercing reminder that every mad life, even yours, could end up a masterpiece. Very fascinating. And I uh, 
look forward to actually watching him again on television now that I've read the entire book and know his, his amazing background. So thank you very much for being with me today. Uh, behind every laughing face, there is also a face of tragedy as uh, Shakespeare once uh, implied and wrote. Uh, I'd like to tell you that we do have a direct email address if you'd like to suggest a book for us to read on our program or to comment on today's reading or any one of our other readings since uh, golly last October. Uh, please feel free to it is very easy it is Friday dash explorations with an S at USA.net again Friday dash explorations at USA.net. Next week, just to give you a little hint about what's coming in the near future, we're going to read from a book uh, that was shortlisted on the Woman's Prize for Fiction, the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2020, not so very long ago, obviously. The writer is Maggie O'Farrell, and the book is Hamnet. Some of you may recognize the fact that Hamnet was the name of the son of William Shakespeare. He had three children, two daughters and a son. A daughter and his son were twins, three children by age 21. Hamnet, H-A-M-N-E-T, not to be confused with the name H-A-M-L-E-T, sadly died at age 11 uh, from the plague and Shakespeare never really got over that. Uh, this is a book, though, about those years in Stratford-upon-Avon. It is a book of fiction. One could push it to a historical fiction because it certainly does have facts involved in it. Uh, but it is not about Shakespeare nor his family. It's about a fictional family. There are a few reverberations, but it is not what you might expect. And it was such a popular book in 2020. So I'm going to introduce you to the world of Stratford-upon-Avon in the uh, mid 16th century. It's an excellent book, um, so I hope you'll join me for it. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we appreciate it, and we hope to see you next week. In the meantime, the fever is broken. The heat wave is over. We seem to be back to normal. Let's hope we stay that way. Thank you again and have a great week ahead. Goodbye.